Bonjour tout le monde. So today, our theme is Impact Matters. I'm going to be taking that theme literally. I'd like to talk to you today about concussion, what we know, what we don't, and how we might rethink our approach to figuring out when it's safe to get back onto the rink, onto the field, onto the court. So concussions are on the rise. I'm showing here data of emergency room visits by youth for concussion. And you can see there's this bulge between the ages of 11 and 18. In the past decade, just for hockey and skating alone, we've seen emergency department visits double. The factors for this are unclear. It could be uh, sociocultural issues around competition, uh, certainly reporting rate increase, what I would consider poor modeling by our professionals, and uh, perhaps equipment isn't nearly uh, as protective, just protective as it once was. It has some offensive element to it as well. But despite that, what I want to focus on today is not concussion prevention, but rather how we can improve the safety of the return to play for our young athletes after they've suffered a concussion. So despite all the media attention around concussion, we actually don't understand when the brain is ready to get back into a competitive skill after suffering a blow. So what do we know? Well, contrary to what you might think, most people don't lose consciousness when they get a concussion. Usually you, you stay awake. In fact, you don't even have to get hit on the head to suffer a concussion. All that has to happen is the inside of your brain has to make impact against the side of your skull. And what that means, as you can see in the video here, is that even a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder contact can cause a concussion. And then you can see here, this is the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder cause of concussion. The player went down, he didn't lose consciousness, but yet he had concussion. So, why, why is that a, a bad thing? Uh, oh, another thing that, contrary to what you might think, is that concussions are cumulative. Once you get one, it's easier to get another one, and the symptoms are typically worse, and they last longer. So even though your performance may be OK, even though you may feel OK and get back on the field, there seems to be something happening at a cellular level where the brain is more susceptible to future injury. Uh, and the reason this is a problem and the reason we really want to prevent multiple concussions is because there's evidence now that with repeated concussions, there's a long-term damage that happens to the brain. And so what I'm showing you here, these are brain slices. This is if you were to take the brain and slice it like this. And those brown areas that you see around the outside, the outside of the brain is where all the action is happening. That's where all the thinking is going on. Those are proteins that are not supposed to be there. It's tau proteins, and, and they interfere with brain function. So these brains haven't been functioning well. And in fact, both of these slices were taken from men who suffered multiple concussions while playing football. The one on the left was a 45-year-old former professional. The one on the right is the youngest case of this type of damage we've seen. He was only 18. And in both cases, uh, these people killed themselves. And so we really need to figure out what's going on to prevent multiple concussions. And lastly, contrary to what you might think, brains don't bounce back, particularly young brains. So this is a study that just came out uh, this week from the University of Montreal showing that, in fact, it takes a lot longer than we, we previously thought. It can take up to a year for a teenage brain to recover from an injury relative to the adult brain. So, what don't we know? We don't know the impact of impact. But what I'd like to do is take the next two minutes to talk about a new approach to how we can better assess getting kids back into the game safely. So what happens right now? You have your concussed athlete, what do you do? Well, you make sure, first of all, before they start doing anything, that their symptoms have gone away. Headache, nausea, dizziness, fog. So once that's gone, you say, great. And then what do you do? Well, you make them sit quietly in a room and do some thinking. So they've got to think. They've got to do these tests on computer, and all they do is think. So they're just thinking. If their thinking is OK, then that's great. You say, you get up, now you've got to move. So you get them moving. You get them moving in the type of sport that they do. And just moving. And if they're moving OK, then you say, fabulous. Back on to play, you go. But the issue is sports require thinking and moving at the same time. You have to be aware of things that are going on. Wayne Gretzky was a genius at this. Uh, there's Tom Brady, has to be aware that he's in the end zone there. You have to pay attention to multiple places. That pitcher is looking at that first base player, but he's actually getting ready to throw down at home plate. So you have to be aware. That Taekwondo, you have to think about strategy. You have to remember what your coach told you. So memory, attention, awareness. Uh, you have to keep all these things in mind. However, traditionally, 
Thinking and moving have been in academic and clinical silos. You test them separately, uh, different granting agencies, different journals, different ways of doing them. But the brain does not keep them separately. The brain puts them together. Now, how do I know that thinking and moving together is harder than thinking alone and moving alone? Because when I'm not working with concussed youth, I'm working with adults in the early stages of dementia. And when you're working with adults with early stage of dementia, you also notice, while it's a different type of brain insult, you see the same type of thing. So for example, you're walking down the hallway, and you're uh, with someone who's in early stages of Alzheimer's, and you start to talk to them. You ask them the question, what do they do? They stop walking. They have difficulty walking and talking at the same time. So I've told you that thinking and moving together is more difficult than thinking alone and moving alone. Don't take it from me. I want you to take it from your own brain. So what I want everybody to do is right now take your hands and start making circles. About one per time. One per second. That's it. Nice circles. Now keep making those circles. Perfect circles is actually hard for, because of the design of your arm. It's actually hard to make a perfect circle. Okay, now without slowing those circles down, I want you to count backwards by seven starting at 100. Let's go. Keep moving. 100, 93, 86. I'm giving you some here. 79. Oh, I don't know if you're catching this, but keep the circles going. Okay, stop. Stop, stop, stop. Wow, okay. That was, that was, that was horrible, actually. As soon as you started counting backwards, it, it was a disaster. Your, your circle slowed way down. And I can tell you, had you just been counting backwards like that on its own, your counting would have been faster. So your counting actually slows down your two. So it's difficult to think and move at the same time. So let's think about the impact of combining thinking and moving together when figuring out the safe return of play for our athletes back onto the field, for the safe return of workers concussed on the job, and for the safety of our seniors in the environment. So we've got to get this right, right? Our kids, they're getting concussed. Now what I don't want you to take away from my six minutes here, uh, and again, I've, I hope I've given you some insight into the challenges that we face, not just in concussion prevention, but in figuring out when it's safe to get them back into the game. What I don't want you to get from this is that you need to pull your child from sports. Sports are really important. Kids do it because it's fun and exciting and they love it and it's really good for them. So it's your uh, job to keep them active, keep them out there. It's our job to figure out when it's safe to get them back in so that they don't have these repeated head problems. Um, and so, finally, I leave you with, we, we've got to get this right, right? These kids, they have one brain. It's got to serve them for the rest of their lives. And so, for me, they are why impact matters. Thank you.